Morning and welcome to Talk Wildlife again and this morning I'm going to talk about something that we've all probably done at some stage in our life, uh, especially if you've been for a holiday to the beach and that is rock pooling. Um, but I'm going to talk about rock pooling with a, a difference because this is extreme rock pooling and I want to introduce Heather Buttervant. Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah. good effort. <laughs> Uh, who has just written a book called Rock Pool, which is an amazing book. I uh, have it here and it is, I highly recommend it. It is a great read. It's just come out in paperback as well tomorrow. Uh, it? Yes, it, it's publishing tomorrow with a whole new beautiful cover. Oh, amazing, amazing. So first of all, let's let's say hello. Um, thank you very much for giving up your time. Okay. And I don't know whether you want to just start off by just giving a little bit of an introduction to yourself and then what we'll do is we'll talk about why rock pools. So if you introduce yourself first of all and then we'll talk about why people should go rock pooling. Fabulous. Okay and um, well I'm I'm unusual in this field as, as in I didn't study marine biology but I grew up in North Cornwall and now live in South Cornwall. I've defected to the opposite coast um, and I think when you grow up by the sea, particularly in, in rural Cornwall, where there aren't any shops and cinemas and other distractions that you can you can go surfing, you can go rock pooling, you can wander about in the dunes. And you know, that, those were the options that were open to us as I was growing up. And I, I always loved nature. I just absolutely adored everything. I was always out looking at birds, looking in the ponds, looking in the rock pools. Um, but I think the thing that always fascinated me most was the beach, the sea, the marine wildlife. And I, I think that's because it's so alien. It's everything, everything in the sea lives in a way that we can't begin to comprehend. You know, we, we can't breathe underwater. We can't survive in the cold. We can't survive at the depths. We can't survive with that constant pounding from the waves. And and it's it's always just been absolute fascination for me looking at these particularly these tiny little animals a lot of what we look at in the UK we have beautiful things but a lot of them you do have to get your eye and a lot of them are very small um, but once you do you have these tiny delicate creatures that are able to survive the most extreme conditions so so I think for me that's that's what's always drawn me to it um, so I started writing a blog um, I can't remember now about five six years ago I started writing a blog just sharing my experiences of being out on the shore, the animals that I was finding. Um, and I developed my photography alongside that so that I could I could really share the beauty of what I was seeing. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I was approached by September Publishing, who um, asked me about putting together a book. Um, so we've, we've been through that that process now, um, created the hardback now, we're to the paperback. And it's all about getting the message out there about this is right on our doorstep or this unseen wildlife that most people don't realise is there is is, yeah, is yeah. Out around Britain. Yeah and I think I mean you, you said it yourself you know it, it is an alien environment and and I think it, it's almost a stage of or a state of, you, you actually almost grow out of rock pooling now not the a geek like me would um, and, and certainly you know my wife and kids we, if we go to a beach we go and look at rock pools um, and I think what tends to happen with a lot of people is that as kids they're fascinated by it um, they go rock pooling when they go to the seaside and then they sort of grow out of it and they end up as adults sort of sitting on the beach nowadays it used to be reading a book uh, nowadays it's probably texting um, while the kids go and have a look in the rock pools but there's so much to see in rock pools. I mean, you, your book just covers, I, th I think it was 24 creatures, but yeah. there's tons of it. So I, I think, you know, people should get back into it. And, and when I say extreme rock pooling, like you do, <laughs> um, what I'm talking about there really is we've all sort of, say, looked at rock pools and we, we've sort of looked at what you would class as the, the upper and the middle intertidal zones. 
um, which is sort of the Jesse's for a joke, is it? Just joking. <laughs> um, and so we'll have seen crabs and we'll have seen hermit crabs, which, you know, everybody loves a hermit crab, um, anemones probably, and loads of different types of shellfish. Yeah. What I want to sort of talk to you about and what, what I want to do is sort of take people sort of down the beach uh, a bit further uh, and into the what is the lower intertidal zone. Yeah. And um, so first of all, I think the best bet is just if you just give a quick overview of what those three are so that we can get an understanding of where the people that are watching this are going to be on the beach when we start talking about what's there. Yeah, sure. And um, maybe we, st we start with the basics, as, as most people will, will be aware. And we have quite big tides in this country. So twice every day the tide comes in and twice every day it goes out again. And um, so when you go onto a beach, you'll, the first thing you normally see is that that strand line or the, the seaweed in a line across the top of the shore. And that's the furthest that the tide comes in every day. And anything below that line will be underwater for some of the time. OK, so as you walk down the beach, you then get to you know, the first rock pools, if you like, you start to see the seaweed. Uh, so that stretch down to those first pools is the upper shore. It's, it's a part of the beach that's only covered by the water for maybe a small proportion of the of the time. But the animals there will have to adapt to obviously both being in and out. Then the mid shore is probably the classic rock pools, the bit that we explore that that has starts to have more wildlife in it. Um, and that's an area that's probably, you know, at least half and half covered by the tide. Um, the bit where it gets for me especially exciting although i find it all quite exciting i have to admit but yeah. as, as you it gets especially exciting as you go further out so what we have is things called neap tides and spring tides which you're probably aware of um so when there's a full moon the gravitational pull on the water is is so much bigger that the tide goes out further and comes in further and that's called a spring tide in between those times, you have the smaller neap tides where the range between high and low water is that bit smaller. Yeah. So what I live for is the, the great big spring tides when ideally you've got the full moon lined up with the sun, you've got maximum pool, which takes that water as far out as it can. And at those times, you're able to access parts of the beach which are underwater for pretty much every hour of pretty much every day of the year. Wow. So, in fact, this week we happen to have some some really big tides, which, you know, unfortunately we're, we're on lockdown. But but um, but a few times a year you get these massive spring tides. And at those times you can access the seabed. You go to places and you can walk around in places which normally only divers would see. Except, of course, divers can normally spend, you know, maybe up to an hour there with their with their air tank. Um, yes. Normally between you've got sort of an hour or two as the tide's going out and maybe an hour before it starts to push in enough that you can explore. So you can spend a good sort of two hours or so exploring this underwater habitat. So that's the lower shore, the bit the bit where you get the biggest diversity of animals, because further up the shore, the, the animals have to adapt constantly. So on the on the upper and mid shore, obviously you've got the sun coming down when the tide comes out, which dries things out. You've got the wind. You've got changes in salt levels in the pools as the pools evaporate and dry out. The salt content goes out, up um, and the oxygen levels change as well, which all of that makes it very, very tough for anything to survive there. And the animals that we find, those crabs and anemones, the things that you talk about that people are used to seeing in the rock pools, the prawns, they are incredible animals because they are uniquely adapted to living in those extreme changing conditions. So, so that's that's the that's the zones of the shore you wouldn't realize just by sitting on a beach or even sort of rock pooling on a beach that there's so much going on you know that there has to be so much adaptation from those individual creatures in order to live in the zones that they live in and you, you sort of you see it you know if you're walking from farmland into woodland into grassland you know that there's sort of different species of birds and butterflies and stuff like that that have adapted but you don't actually sort of comprehend that that all of that has to happen on a beach as well which is just amazing just amazing now just one thing just before we go and talk about the lower intertidal zone because what you've just said there just struck something in my mind and, and that is basically people's safety um, clearly, you know, if you if you're in the upper limits, then you know not too bad. But the further down you get, you you've got to be aware of certain things. 
Yeah. Um, so what's the best ways to make sure that you're being careful? Uh, OK, I think on the beach there are maybe three three or four big things um, to, to watch out for. Uh, the first, obviously, I've already talked about tides. Yeah. Um, uh, being cut off by the tide is one of the main reasons that the lifeboat gets called out. Yeah. It, it accounts for about a third of lifeboat calls out for, for call outs from the statistics I've seen. Um, it is really important that any time you go to the beach, particularly if you're planning to walk down the beach and explore, that you check the tide times before you go, that you know what time the low tide is. And that is not the time to aim for. You don't want to get there at low tide. You yeah. want to arrive an hour or two before the low tide. And when it gets to that time of the low tide, you want to be thinking about leaving the beach. Um, yeah. Because a mistake a lot of people make is they say, oh, you know, I think I'm going to walk out there. Let's see what time the low tide is. And, yeah. you know, and so they aim for that type time. Actually, at that time, um, the tide may already be starting to come in because those tide times are predictions, not absolute set in stone. They may vary depending on conditions. Obviously, the other thing to watch out for is the weather and the sea state. Um, the beach is very exposed and you get big waves coming in. So even though you might have a massive tide, as we've had the last few months over the winter, we've had really great tides, but actually the lower shore has been to my mind, inaccessible because of the size of the waves coming in, which means you get the surge and those yes. those waves are incredibly powerful, very dangerous. You know, where you live, I'm sure you're aware of the power of the sea as well. Um, so it's, you know, you don't mess with that. You don't go, don't never go too close to the sea, watch the conditions and be aware that the tide doesn't come in necessarily in a straight line because the beach profile may go up and down in different places. So you go up to rock here and actually the tide can be coming in around you, behind you. Um, all of those things. Plus, plus, just to add to it, the, the seaweed on the rocks is massively slippery. Uh, you know, I, I know it well. I've, I've come a cropper a few times and I'm, I'm so careful. But when you're walking on particularly wet seaweed, um, your feet can just go from under you and it's, it's hard, sharp rocks underneath there. So it's easy to twist your ankle, do yourself an injury. Yeah. And, you've got, and you've got the cliffs around the just to finish it off, you've got the cliffs around the edge of the beach. Um, you need to always stay at least cliff cliff height away from the edge of those cliffs because you know, again I see people on the beach who will go climb up the cliffs and have a look what's there. No, um, you yeah, know yeah. E even areas like you know some place around Cornwall the cliffs are relatively solid. Um, you know even places like that you never know. You know it, even a small rock coming off coming off the cliff which can happen any time is is going to knock you out at best. So. Yeah. So yeah, they stay safe. Look at the tide times. Keep away from the edge of the sea. Obviously, if you if you do take children rock pooling, don't sit at the top of the beach. Go with them. Be with them because the pools can be deep. There's tides. There's currents. You know, um, lovely for kids to go, to go off exploring, but at least be keeping a keeping an eye, particularly with younger children as well. So yeah, no, that that's really useful. I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely don't let it put you off, but just. As, as you said, stay safe. Yeah, plan so, plan what you're doing. Wear wear good shoes as well. Well, wear wellies. You're going out in flip flops or Crocs and things on the rock. You know, I see a lot of people trying to do it, and it's you, you're you're twisting ankle easily. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, and that, end of safety. Back to things. the lower intertidal zone. Right. I've picked on a few species. I'm going to talk the sort of first about sort of three of them. And the, the reason I'm going to talk about three of them, or, or should I say you're going to talk about these three, is that it's it's species that I don't think people actually would expect to see around the UK. They, they think that it's things that you see sort of in tropical areas. Mm -hmm. And those three are coral, sharks and pipefish. Yeah. So we're going to talk about them first, or you're going to talk about them first. And then what we're going to move on to is, is something that your book sort of rekindled it in my head, um, and that is the sea squirt. And I've suddenly become a huge fan of sea squirts. And uh, you'll find out why if you keep watching. But let, let's talk first of all about these three species. So corals. You expect corals to be at the, around the likes of the Caribbean and Australia and in the Mediterranean. You don't expect corals to be around the UK. It's just you just think that nah, it just doesn't happen because we're not tropical enough. Talk to me about corals. OK, um, yeah, so we, we do have quite a few different species of coral around the UK. Um, corals, uh, to go back to basics, are animals that have little stinging cells. So they're related to jellyfish. They're related to anemones, those little sort of flower like animals in the rock pools with tentacles. Um, and 
uh, on the shore, the uh, the corals that we can find um, are cup corals. Now, I've got I've got a uh, one here that I actually found on a washed up fishing net. Yeah, if you could hold that around about your chin height. Yeah. And then uh, right. I saw a coral and a catfish. Yes, yeah, so the catfish going to. <laughs> Thank you, Miss D. This is Miss D, my my assistant. Yep. Um, so so the cup coral, as you can see, it's got this hard skeleton. That's the cup, um, and that's actually from a Devonshire cup coral. Um, they can get a fair bit bigger than than that. Those were quite little ones. Um, so cup corals are tend to be solitary. The ones that I find on the shore around Cornwall, which means you find one on its own rather than a big a big mass of them um but the the one that i find on the beach that i grew up at, uh, near um which i didn't know i didn't know there were cup corals there I, I spent my whole childhood going to this beach loving it exploring the rock pools always go back and it was only a few years ago that i was down there with my mum and my my partner and um, my young lad that we were exploring we we're exploring the beach and i went off down a gully and looked under a, under a rock and it, it was, I think I describe it in the book, but it was the most exciting moment. I felt like I'd found, you know, treasure galleon because out of the darkness underneath this rocky overhang in this deep, clear pool were these little bright orange lights almost. They, they looked like they were, they were literally little, little orange fairy lights in there. Um, so obviously being me, I'd, I'd crawl right under this rock and stick my head in the water and, and take a look. Um, but they are they are very small. Those those cup corals that I find they probably are similar size to this little this little one. Um, and but when you get up close, they've got these lovely translucent tentacles, which is where the stinging cells are, and that cup shape. And they're bright orange and sometimes yellow as well. Those ones they're absolutely stunning little corals. Um, and the cup corals are, are really interesting because they actually live in the most inaccessible dangerous places they're small they're delicate but they but they live in those those places where you know in in the winter you go and take pictures of the amazing waves breaking those sorts of places anywhere that you see pictures taken of like whoosh in almost storm waves breaking that's where they like to live and they'll live at the back of a, a rock or somewhere where that energy is really channeled because what they rely on is the the water coming in and bringing them little bits of food in the plankton that their their tentacles can sting pick up um, so so they, those are the cup corals and they they are the most beautiful things the, the the most difficult to find and they're the ones where you have to go down wave washed gullies and so th these are not the things I was you talk about my health and safety briefing you know if you're just going for a quiet people in the rock pool yeah. you're very unlikely to see these and you need to be very careful and I think quite experienced probably with and know your shore know your beach well before you go to the places they might they might occur, but sorry, catfishes. Yeah, come and I know um, it, it's it, that again. Something that's just struck me that um, that you say that there, there are guided sort of walks to these areas, aren't they? I know, I know, I can see from your book um, and from your blogs that you actually do lead some walks. So there are those available, out there, and I suggest people sort of look around the sort of the wildlife trusts and things like that because they do run these things and. I mean, I, I can't wait for lockdown to be over. I've got to find a beach. I've got to find a rock pool. I've got to go there. Now, before we move on to sharks, um, before we started recording, you you flushed a bit of coral up, and I, th oh. I think we should definitely show that. Okay. So, so this, um, sorry, I can't see my own screen anymore, but this is called a pink sea fan. Now, this you wouldn't actually ever find in a rock pool. This lives further down in the sea. It's um, it, it lives at around sort of ten meters depth plus, and it's it's a it's a colonial coral if you like. So what you have on the strands, it's it almost looks like seaweed underneath. Uh, it looks like a branch, yeah. and each of these is made of little polyps, little little individual corals, little individual coral polyps that each have their own stinging cells. And they grow very, very slowly, you know, maybe only a centimetre or two a year. Um, 
and which means they can live for a really long time. Um, you know, they're, they're believed to live for 50 years plus. Uh, some people believe they live for 100 years. We, we don't really fully, fully know, but they certainly take quite a long time to grow to even this size, which makes them very delicate. And they, they live on the seabed attached to attached to rocks by this little, looks like a little root system, little hold fast there. Um, so they, they live attached onto the rocks. Um, and they are beautiful when they're alive. Now, I had a photo, where has it gone? In here. I might be able to, I might be able to show. Yeah, yeah. If you hold it, so again, I, I, I hate to sort of cover your face, but I'm just conscious of yeah. how this records. So if you hold it, yeah, and then up a bit. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah. so that's what they look like when they're alive. You can see there that lovely pink colour, although they are sometimes white as well. Um, and all of that pink is these little tiny polyps. Um, it makes them very vulnerable. So as you know, we, you know, we, we have quite a big fishery in this country, um, and one of the main methods of fishing is trawling. Um, and you know, while that's a very effective method of bringing up fish for, for human consumption, it is like ploughing a field. It's, it's, it can completely wipe out the seabed in the areas that are, are trawled. Um, so it's obviously important that we do our best to avoid as far as possible, trawling, trawling pink sea fans um, and and destroying the habitat because they take so long to grow that if, if you trawl them, they're not going to be back for a long time. Yeah. So the, the next species, which I think some people might be aware of because the Northern Maiden's Purse. Well, can I just say, by the way, that that photo was from Paul Naylor's, Paul Naylor's book. Yep. Great British Marine Animals. Um, lovely, lovely photos in there. I'd recommend that one as well. I'll, I'll see if I can find a link to his website and I'll put that up as well. So, um, yeah, so sharks. So, yeah. you know, people are used to finding maiden's purses. I, I have um, I have one in my education centre back at Penstock. Kids don't believe that it, it, you know, could belong to a, a species of shark. Um, I know you had a, a close encounter with the shark because I've read it in your book. Don't want you to sort of go in detail about that one because I want people to read your book because I think they'll really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but talk to talk to us about sharks around our coastline. OK, so as as a rock pooler, there are two species of shark that I come across, um, both adults, well, adults, babies and their eggs. Um, so the smaller of the two, people tend to know it's a dogfish. Yeah. Um, although it's actually a cat shark and I, it's always bewildered me that an animal can be a cat and a yeah. dog. I'm not I'm not quite sure why. Um, but but the the dogfish is the lesser, lesser spotted cat shark, the Scylorhinus canicula. Um, and the that one grows to you know, maybe sort of 70 centimetres, so it's like sort of a couple of feet, is it, in old money. Um, and they have incredibly rough skin. Um, which is, you know, shark skin, shark skin technology now is being used all over the place because although shark skin is rough, it enables them to swim very fast. Um, and I think in the in the dogfish or cat sharks um, case, it probably also helps to protect them against any other predators and things because it is so it is so abrasive to touch. So in the old days, some um, fishermen used to keep cat shark skins and use them as sandpaper you know, it gets sold as sandpaper. And it really is it just in one direction. You can, you can sort of touch in one direction, but not the other. But uh, yeah, really, really abrasive. And you could do yourself damage trying to pick one up if you weren't using gloves. Um, so th these cat sharks live in live in our local waters. Um, the, the one that people see the most is that smaller spotted cat shark. Um, but there's also the greater spotted, which actually grows to, um, you know, I'm about, you know, one meter sixty five. It's that sort of that sort of length when it's fully grown. Um, I think my books say so up to two metres, um, which is quite that's a fair, quite a size. It's a fair size animal. Yeah. yeah, that's quite a size. Yeah, so as, as you know, I, I've encountered, I have encountered those in, well, I say the rock pools um, at the very lowest spring tides, there are often big areas of water, water that you can walk through that are then only sort of knee heights, but uh, form big lagoons, if you like, and animals will sometimes get trapped at the very lowest tides in those areas. So that's where I tend to encounter the larger cat sharks. The smaller ones will sometimes be stranded in a rock pool, you know, partway up the shore because they like to lie 
you know, if, if people dive, they'll know that the catch ups like to lie at the bottom of gullies. They sort of sleep down there. So if you've got a long rocky gully, you'll sometimes find sort of catch ups just sort of pulled up together, having a little having a little kip. Um, so I quite often find those stranded on the shore. But um, around where I live, which is Lou in southeast Cornwall um, and other places around Cornwall, I know there's um, similar things in Wembury and Devon and there'll be others scattered around the country. We're only just trying to find out about where all these places are. But there are certain places which we like to call cat shark nurseries. OK, um, because the cat sharks will come in there to lay their eggs and not all not all sharks lay eggs of course you know um a lot will give birth to live young but our both of our species of cat shark um that we see in inshore waters on the and particularly on, in the intertidal lay egg cases and their egg cases are um i've got is this quite an old battered one but yeah see that okay um yeah. So this is this is from the greater spotted cat shark, the larger of the two species. Right. This one's completely dried out when it's when it's soaked in water. It's probably twice that size, pretty much um, sort of yay big. Right. Um, so it's a fair it's a fair size shark that lays it. Um, and what they have on the end, if you can see, is these frilly tendrils. And those are designed, they have them on both ends and they're designed to grip onto the seaweed. Right. So they sometimes they sometimes lay on um, the pink sea fan what, further down in the water on the shore they lay on the most beautiful seaweed that you know it's, it's stunning that the rainbow rack and the, the rainbow the rainbow rack um tamariscophilia has has this amazing iridescence so when it's in the water you look into the water it, lo it looks like a rainbow it's it's turquoise and green and blue and all these all these colors that catch the light a bit like peacock feathers you know um yeah, yeah. Um, if you if you take it out of the water, it looks brown. Yeah. It's only in the water that it's got this this property. Um, but the, the cat sharks like to swim up to clumps. It's bushy seaweed. And unlike some other seaweeds, it does stay pretty much all year in place, which means that they can come along, lay their egg case, attach it to the seaweed. And these have to be on on the seaweed for about seven, seven months, seven to nine months is the estimated. There's some um, tagging projects going on in, in Wembury and Devon and other places where where people are putting tags on on the egg cases when they're freshly laid so they can monitor how long it takes them to hatch out and right. every month and, and um, get more information on this but it's sort of assumed from aquaria and things it's about seven to nine months that these these little things are attached and if you hold them up to the light when they're when they're in the in the rock pool, so obviously at the very lowest tides I can get there and they're exposed you can see these egg cases um, if you gently hold the seaweed up to the light with the sun behind it, at first when they're freshly laid, they're completely clean and shiny. And inside you can see the yolk. You can see the yolk of this egg. And um, obviously as, as, the, as the shark inside develops, you can then see a tiny little shark swimming around next to the yolk. And when it's nearly ready to hatch, you can see a you know, full grown baby shark inside moving around, which is just fabulous obviously it's really important that we don't disturb the shark yeah, nurseries. Yeah, I was about to um, say that. nobody don't don't ever pull an egg case off off seaweed if you do find one it's wonderful take a photo have a look fine but but then leave, leave it well alone and um, they're, they're meant to be in the water obviously so when we've got the very lowest tides they can be exposed for a short time it doesn't seem to do any damage um but obviously if anybody comes along and, and disturbs the seaweed or pulls the egg case off then it's, if it's not attached, then it's it's very unlikely to survive. Um, but having said that, they are wonderful, wonderful things. And what happens after the seven to nine months, the, look, the little shark pushes out of the end of the egg case, splits open and and they swim out. And on the shore down here, often it's these sorts of tides, actually, the very big spring tides, you know, we'll sometimes find little tiny, well, I say tiny, they're sort of yay, yay long, um, just hatched baby cat sharks. Um, we do get the the other cat shark lays their eggs as well and they're they're much smaller so only you know when they're even when they're wet they're only about that big. Um, we sometimes see those as well but the ones we see on the, the beaches down here are mostly this greater spotted cat shark and the the baby these wonderful little things they often sit quite close to the egg case so you can you can watch them watch them. Yeah and so that brings us to the third one, um, pipefish. Oh, so yeah. 
yeah so we'll talk a little bit about pipefish and then i'm going to move on to sea squirts so bear with us because sea squirts are coming and, and sea squirts are amazing and um, <laughs> so yeah so pipefish so pipefish related to seahorses is that right yeah it, exactly that they're so, all in, they're all in the same family so um if if you if you know what a seahorse looks like which i think pretty much everyone does even little kids know what a seahorse looks like which yeah. is lovely even though of course we we do have we do have two species of seahorse that we get in this country um i am constantly looking for them in theory it might be possible on the lowest tides to come across one on on the shore um they they are known for living in seagrass um which is the only flowering plant in the in the, the oceans you know most of the, most of the plants that we have in our seas are seaweeds algae um, which don't don't produce flowers they re reproduce in all sorts of funny slimy ways um, but um, the seagrass has you wouldn't really you wouldn't put them in a vase okay they're, they're not beautiful flowers they're, they're, they are they are like a grass they have very very tiny almost invisible little seeds and flowers on them um, they they look like grass and they form these meadows you get these rhizostomes these, these little uh, root systems almost that that grow underneath underneath the sediment and they help to hold the sediment together which makes them really important for managing floods and they reduce wave energy which can can help help with coastal management um, and they provide this amazing habitat so seahorses are known for living in them and they they're also found in fact very much found around the edges of the seagrass beds um, so management of those areas is really important for seahorses um, their cousins are the pipefish and the pipefish are long thin almost like eel like long thin fish um you know sort of shaped like a pencil really um and the greater pipe fish that we see which gets to sort of about about as long as most of the time, about about as long as my forearm there at least um they're quite quite long creatures they yeah yeah I'm expect them to be as long as that yeah they're, they're yeah, the, the greater pipefish are really quite big. The, the little ones that we see mostly on the shore are called worm pipefish, and they're only, you know, yay big. Um, but we get other sorts as well. And they have a face just like the seahorse. If you look at the profile, they've got the same, you know, big forehead and long snout that you'd expect to see on a seahorse. Um, but instead of having that curly, curly body, they've got a long straight body. Um, that's the difference. But I think pipefish are, they're, they're wonderful animals they're very very interesting they, they look unlike any other fish they, they don't look like they should be able to swim because they don't they don't really have such bendy bodies they don't have such obvious fins um some of them have almost no visible fins which you know not even the tail one it's so you, you wonder how they can swim but they they sort of snake through the water and they've got little fins on their backs that, that flicker just like if you've ever watched a seahorse swim, they've got the same like, little flickery fin on the back. Yeah. Um, and some have a little fin on their tail as well. But I think what's what's always most fascinating about seahorses um, is that, as we all know, it's the male who has a pouch and looks after looks after the young in there. So the female lays the eggs and the, the male broods them in his pouch until they swim out in a big puff. Um, and the pipefish being in the same family do effectively the same thing. So the little worm pipefish that we see on the shore has this groove, like a bit like you if I do my zip, it's got a groove like that down its belly. The male has this groove. And instead of a pouch, he has a groove and he keeps he keeps pairs of eggs all the way down his groove. So the female lays them onto there and he, he looks after them. Um, and then they hatch straight out into the plankton from there. The the other pipefish species like the the snake pipefish the greater pipefish i believe have have more of a have more of a, a pouch they've got a slightly different system um so very much like the seahorse and but again it is the male that breeds the young and i think one thing that i said in my book it was it's one year um it was around time i've got a summer birthday which is a wonderful thing um so it was around that time of year i went down to one of one of the beaches that i could walk to it's a few few miles off that way um and being me, you know, talk about extreme rock pooling, you know, I kind of start off in the rock pools and keep going and keep going and keep going. And I started going down this gully and it was getting deeper and deeper. I was sort of following the tide out, but I was sort of up to, it gets to the point, I was up to sort of my waist, my chest in the water, looking through the kelp. And I just remember see, seeing what, what looked to me like a little worm swim past, just a little white, little white, tiny 
were. I was like, oh, what's that? And I saw another one. So I, I grabbed a tub and scooped, scooped these little things up. And I've been looking for it, at it for a few seconds before I realised what I had. And it was a just hatched, I believe. You know, it can't have been, I think, more than a, a few days old. Um, little baby greater pipefish. And the greater pipefish, you know, they do have, they have a hexagonal cross section, a bit like, you know, a bit like your biro. Um, so if you, I, I don't suggest anybody cuts a pipefish in half, but if you did, it'd be, it'd be a hexagon yeah, yeah. shape all the way, all the way through. Um, and, and these little babies had, had that shape to them as well. And the beautiful long snout and the tiny little fins and what they had as well, which just blew my mind. They still had like a little yolk sack underneath they had this little bit of yellow and I was looking for it for, at it for a while for I read it it must be the I assume the remnants of of the the yolk sac from from when they're being in their father's pouch so they really were very recently born I think so yeah Fab, fabulous fabulous animals that is the only time I've ever found greater pipefish babies in the pools and to be honest I, I don't think I've really heard of other people finding them they you don't often you don't often come across them because they're so they're so tiny they'll disappear among the among the seaweed you know very very quickly but you know, I'm, I'm sure someone must have found them as well but they that would that just blew my mind that day seeing them. imagine and all of this around our shores yeah. and that's what is going to sort of be amazing to a lot of people right okay so here's what we're going to do we've been talking now you're not going to believe this but we've been talking now for going on 36 minutes Sorry. <laughs> um, and I had planned to talk about sea squirts, but if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is I'd like to close this one here and I'd like to then do another one Yeah. Um, that is just about sea squirts and maybe another couple of species, but certainly about sea squirts because sea squirts are just amazing things. Brilliant. So I hate to do this to you and I certainly hate to do this to people that are watching seeing as I've big them up. and. Trust me, you've got to watch this video when it happens. Um, so I think we will leave it there. Brilliant. And, you know, we will come back and talk about sea squirts. Obviously, people have got to rush out now. And I'm sure that if, if anything drove people to buy your book, it's got to have been how animated you were here. The fact that we have gone to nearly 40 minutes is, is just brilliant. And I seriously could listen to it. I got quite excited there. A so, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so, so people, yeah, you know, do again. go out and buy the book. It's amazing. It's a really, really good book. And the way that Heather describes the encounter with the shark is just amazing. It's really, really great. So I suggest you do go out and buy the book. But anyway, in the meantime, I think what we'll do is we'll leave it. I know you've got you're working on another book anyway. So yeah. we'll talk about that when we talk about sea squirts. Yeah, perfect. Um, but thank you ever so much. It was it was really insightful. It was really great. It, it was great to see sort of bits and pieces you found on the beach. And when we talk about sea squirts, I want to want to talk about the other thing you found recently. So there's another reason to watch. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to mention that. The thing. The thing. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as well. Um, it was great meeting your cat. <laughs> And she's still here. She's she's settled down on my on my paperwork. <laughs> right. So yeah. So we'll leave it there. As I say, I, I really do want to talk to you straight after this about how we can rearrange another interview to talk about more stuff. Because again, I want to. You touched on seagrass. I want to talk about seagrass um, because it's it's a habitat that needs looking after, and not a lot of people know about it. So we want to talk a bit more about that. But for now. Episode one, I'll bring to a close. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Heather. That was great. Thanks, Alan. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk again very soon, probably sooner than you think. <laughs> Thanks very much, Heather. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye.